So to talk to us about fertility treatment and options available in South Africa for couples who wish to conceive, we're now joined by Dr. Lawrence Gobitz, who is the infertility specialist at Vita Lab. Doctor, good evening and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Sebastian. Good evening. So infertility is really, a, a, you know, a global prevalence and actually the available data actually indicate that um, what less than 50 million couples worldwide actually experience infertility. No, it, it affects 10% of the reproductive population, irrespective of, you know, uh, color, race, creed. Uh, it makes no difference. So the incidence mm. is pretty static. And therefore, as, as the population grows, therefore, you know, the incidence or the number of people suffering from the problem will increase. And uh, the other biggest problem for us is the fact that uh, women are delaying their childbearing. And that is our, our single most important issue, why we are experiencing more patients with a problem. So it's not common now for females to fall pregnant when they should, and that's somewhere between 16 and 26. You know, women are waiting till they're 40 and don't appreciate that their prime is when they're young and their eggs get much older and they become less fertile. Mm. So you discussed the, the two issues, primary and secondary. Primary refers to uh, couples who have not yet experienced a pregnancy or conceived. And secondary is patients who already have a child and now are having difficulty having another child. Mm. Mm. So, well, as you've mentioned, there are quite a, a number of factors that contribute to infertility. But what are really the main causes of infertility? Well, we, we divide it up into a third female reasons, a third male, and then another third, which is a combination. So you could have both a female problem and a male problem. So a male problem is easy. We talk about the sperm not being strong enough. In other words, the count is either too weak or they're not moving uh, well enough to, to travel a long distance to get to the egg. Or um, the actual shapes of the sperm are not normal and therefore cannot fertilize an egg. So that's sort of the male factor in broad terms. In the female, we talk about um, factors around the uterus itself, the pathway, so the tubes may be damaged, there may be a problem inside the womb, there may be fibroids, there may be polyps, which are benign growths in the, in the uh, actual cavity of the womb. Uh, the patient may not be ovulating either regularly or not at all. Mm. Um, and then, as I said, our, our biggest problem today is egg age. So uh, there's a big difference because testicles have got stem cells and males keep making sperm until the day they die. But females have a very limited time span when they are at their most fertile. And after 26, the egg quality starts to age. Women do not have stem cells. They don't make new eggs. So when they're 38 or 39, the eggs are their age plus nine months because those eggs were given to them when they were in their mother's womb. Wow. And that's the biggest problem. And unfortunately, nobody educates the female and nobody educates one at school to understand this but so what do you do about it because you can't convince our young scholars to now go and put the eggs in the freezer because they're probably only going to settle down and want their first child when they're over 40 today mm, you mm, know and mm. I, it's more important to get yourself a degree and establish yourself in the big world and make yourself a bit of money and put in the account and then you'll hopefully meet Mr. Wright <laughs> and when Mr. Wright comes along it's Mr. Wrong you know it's like a computer and out with Mr. That's Wright a, you're telling my Mr. life Wright. story right now because you know I, I must admit I'm one of those women that have been holding back on having a child uh, mainly because I'm, I'm a single woman so I'm not married but I'm 35 and I still don't have my first born I have I don't have my first child as yet for various reasons and some of those are reasons which you would have mentioned but now you you see you're painting this picture for me and and you speak a lot of us not having been educated about these issues I think it's it's more about really putting your priorities in straight or prioritizing what you feel is more important at that given moment, you know, in your life, you know, in that period, whatever period you're in, in your life. But, you know, now it's, it's sort of like making so much sense when you talk about the impact that this really has in the long run. So, you know, using myself as a case study then, doctor, what does this then mean for me? Um, if I decide to, I'm 35 this year, so if I decide to have a child, let's say at the age of 37, yeah. what are the odds? Are the odds going to be against me? What, you know, what, what are the chances of, 
Yeah, the longer you take um, seriously to fall pregnant and the older you are, the less likely you are going to fall pregnant naturally. So mm-hmm. it seems like pregnancy early on in, 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 in sort of your youthful uh, prime age group um, is protective. And you find that if you conceive early on, it tends to protect you and you can end up having five or six kids. Even when you're 40, you could be on your fifth child. But if you're setting out at 37 or 38 for the first time, there's a greater chance that you are going to have difficulty purely because of the egg age and no other reason. Mm -hmm. And fortunately now, over the last five years, we've really developed a very robust freezing technology. So today, one of the concepts to consider is egg freezing, which is an insurance policy for you. And you put the eggs in the freezer, you then go and try and fall pregnant at 37 or 38. And if you don't achieve a pregnancy, you can at least rely on the eggs of 35 that have the potential, even though you're now 40, the 35-year-old eggs in the freezer have 35-year-old potential. So um, ideally, we are getting more and more patients coming forward. We we have single women, they're 39, 40, they're desperate because they haven't found Mr. Right yet, Mm -hmm. and they're putting their eggs in the freezer. And the problem for us is they should have put their eggs in the freezer when they were in their 20s. Of course, yes. Because what happens is as you get older, more and more of the eggs are genetically abnormal. Mm -hmm. And it's not that they will be giving you a higher incidence of abnormal children, it's just that those embryos don't implant. Ah. And therefore, you know, the nature nature is, the, is, is a major selector of good versus abnormal. Mm. So um, at the end of the day, that's why there's more difficulty when females are older. Mm. And so, Doctor, you also spoke about, you know, uh, infertility uh, when caused by a, a, a low sperm count in the male. And you say yeah. usually there are a few resolutions for this problem. And, and what are those? Well, often it's it's most likely related to the fact that that is the factory and that's what the factory is producing. So it's not so easy to treat the male unless there are hormonal reasons. So there may be thyroid problems. There could be a prolactin. It's a stress hormone that may be elevated. So depending on the degree of the abnormality, one would examine the male. You need to look at the size of the testicles. You need to make sure that the pipes that get the sperm from the testicle out um, at the time of ejaculation are present. You need to make sure the hormones that are important, not all the hormones, and make sure that they're all normal. And then ultimately you have to work with what you've got, you know. And the Interestingly, the male fluctuates by up to 40% day for day. And commonly, they will go in with a low sperm count and they'll get treatment from the GP and two months later, they'll repeat the analysis and it looks better. And it's not related to any vitamins or anything like that. It's just related to the pure normal fluctuation that one sees. So we don't have really good medical therapies for the male factor. But fortunately, we have assisted reproductive technology. So we have IVF and we also have a technology that we call ICSI, where we pick up single sperm and with a glass needle, 14 times thinner than a human hair can inseminate the sperm directly into the egg and get normal uh, embryos and normal babies from that technology and that technology has been around since 94 Is this in, is this uh, in vitro fertilization? That is a form of in vitro fertilization okay. but it is called ICSI, I-C-S-I intracytoplasmic sperm injection so nowadays for, if we can get 10 eggs out of a female we only need 10 good looking sperm So, you know, we have treatments that we can now help males with really severe infertility where prior to 94 you would have to encourage them to use donor sperm. We can now get them to father father their own biological child. Mm -hmm. Wow, wow. So so let's talk then about the other treatment options. There's uh, artificial insemination, there's your ovulation. Which one really has, I don't know if, if this is an unfair question, but which one has the highest success rate? Um, IVF has the highest success rate. The biggest problem is that patients are not evaluated correctly Mm -hmm. and they are then given treatment protocols which are totally inappropriate. In other words, if you've got a 40-year-old female and has never fallen pregnant and the male's got absolutely perfectly normal sperm, to do intrauterine insemination for that couple is a total waste of time, energy and money because by doing insemination, you're not going to change the quality of the eggs. Wow. So, you know, patients are unfortunately treated empirically, empirically meaning that we don't really know why they're not falling pregnant. And the doctors are applying treatment to these patients and wasting their time and money. 
So ovulation induction is really for people who are not ovulating. Mm. So a lot of patients who aren't falling pregnant will see the gynecologist. The gynecologist will give them a prescription for four months of Clomid, which uh, I'm sure you've heard of. It's a drug you take orally to try and help ovulation. Mm. But if you are ovulating regularly, the Clomid is not going to help you fall pregnant. So it's only indicated if the female is not ovulating and the, and the likelihood that she's not ovulating if she's having regular 28-day cycles with premenstrual symptoms is very small. So again, you know, a patient will see a, a regular gynecologist or a GP will say, you know, we've been trying for a year and they'll start with the Clomid and uh, the patient doesn't fall pregnant and what they haven't done is looked at the poor man and he's got one sperm wrapped in elastoplast balancing on a crutch. So Clomid is not going to help the male factor. So it is a couple's problem and you need to look at the couple correctly. So we say that if the female's under 35, yeah, if they've been trying for a year and there's no other problems, in other words, she's menstruating regularly, he has had no problems that has affected his scrotum or, or he hasn't been on chemotherapy or especially today, which is common, males are given testosterone because they go to the GP and tell them they're feeling low and tired, you know, and one, one has a lot of stress today. And the, the first thing they do is give them testosterone injections and it's the best contraceptive for the man. So we need to evaluate the couple and we need to find out where the problems are and then one needs to treat the actual problem and in that situation it's vital because we get patients who uh, get treated elsewhere and we have women who've had six laparoscopies in as many years and they've never checked the male and the male then when we do check him has no sperm so the poor woman has had a whole lot of unnecessary surgery and very costly surgery for the health funders and at the end of the day the patient is still not pregnant so I think uh, one of the warnings is make sure that if a doctor says he needs to do a laparoscopy on you because you're not falling pregnant, get a second opinion, because that's not a first-line evaluation. So I think the take-home message here is that these patients, you have help in South Africa. There are fertility clinics in South Africa. You can Google them. And I think that's the place that one should start. Uh, patients say, you know, treatment is very expensive, but when they actually evaluate all the money that they've spent on all the unnecessary blood tests and unnecessary other tests and unnecessary treatments, they could have saved a lot, a lot of money had they gone to the right place mm, first absolutely. and got the proper evaluation and then treatment directed at their specific couple's problem, not a bottom draw cookie cutter one size fits all. Mm, absolutely. And you know, Doctor, um, in the beginning you mentioned quite something very important. You, you, you spoke about the importance of actually looking and observing couples correctly, both of them uh, as individuals. And uh, also so I think let's touch on um, infertility in couples who already have a child. Yes. What causes infertility then in those situations? Okay, um, the most common thing we are seeing there um, is the fact that the female has her first child at 38 or 39. Mm -hmm. And then they struggle because of the egg age and the ah. quality of the eggs. And then they arrive at us at 41. And at 41... The reason for them not falling pregnant is no other than obviously egg age and significant reduced potential. And now it's very difficult because IVF originally came out for young women with blocked tubes. Mm. And that was in the late 70s, early 80s. And then we said, well, it is working, so let's use it for women with other problems or couples with other problems with open tubes, endometriosis, sperm problems. And it worked even better. And then eventually when we started to move into the 2000s and the latter 2000s, we were starting to see this influence of the females delaying their childbearing. So a common reason is number one, the egg age. So delayed pregnancy, first child much older, and when they come for the second child, they've lost that potential to have a sibling. The other issues are maybe at the time of the delivery they had a Caesar, there may have been a problem, the Caesar could have uh, caused uh, scars in the womb. You know, we don't see patients that have one, two, three, four Caesars. We see patients who have one Caesar and then have difficulty subsequently, and we sometimes find a scar in the womb. Not that the doctor's negligent, it just does happen, you know, at the time of the procedure is one of the risks. Um, so, there, you know, there could be other things that have happened. The patient may be on drugs that are stopping her from ovulating. Um, but the most common reason for us, uh, 
um, special is the fact that these women have their first child much later, and when they try for their second child, you know, a 42-year-old sits in front of me, and you look at them and you think, but this woman doesn't look older than 30, you know. They're all trim and slim and all at the gym and uh, looking after themselves, but the ovary does not get on the same treadmill. <laughs> and you can't Botox the ovary. And that's the unfortunate part, hey? Yeah. So the sooner the better, that's your advice. The sooner the better. Otherwise, if we look at exponential growth in technology and our abilities now to robustly freeze eggs, we need to have a campaign out there to try and encourage young girls to, as an insurance policy, put their eggs in the freezer, but try and do it before they turn 32, not to do it when they're 38 or 40. Mm. And so, Doctor, um, you, you touched on uh, fertility clinics and uh, institutions. What is your opinion on, on South Africa's fertility treatment service, uh, services? You know, experts have for the longest time been saying how infertility treatment in this country has not been prioritized with limited resources and, and, and you know, the fact that we only have very few government-funded academic hospitals providing infertility services. Of course, that means uh, private care will be more expensive. What, what is the uh, standard of, of facility of for infertility clinics in this country well i can talk for our unit um, our unit's been going for 35 years our unit consists of six doctors and 57 other staff members and uh, we have very high pregnancy rates and we offer patients the same kind of service that they would get in top units overseas so we are a referral base for the rest of africa and for patients coming from europe australia america um, because of the rand dollar exchange rate and because of the superior care that they get. So, yes, you, you've touched on a very sensitive issue, and that is the issue that it is expensive treatment and it's not something that you can, um, you know, just open up to the masses. But the important issues are, unfortunately, in our country, there's a lot of unnecessary stuff that's being done on patients, which the medical aides or the health funders know, and they are supporting all of this. And until we can control unnecessary surgery, unnecessary uh, treatment protocols, and save that money there, I am sure the health funders will be able to channel that money into helping patients who are, 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 do not have the means to afford private health care. And, uh, you know, the NHI that's coming out now, um, you know, again, that's for primary care. And they don't view infertility as, uh, you know, a primary care, although it is, according to law, a prescribed minimum benefit. But the important issue that is if you work out 10% of the population with a problem, it's one of the most common illnesses in any country. Mm. More common than any other form of disease, yeah, you know. Um, so at the end of the day, you're looking at, at a scenario which is extremely difficult because, yes, the treatment is not cheap. If you have to do IVF, it is expensive. Uh, about how all, much, you know, Doctor? Can you just give us some kind of indication as to, you know, what, what, what is the, the average price for a typical IVF? Or the well, price IVF range? Cost, IVF, depending on the age of the female and the drug usage that you need, it could cost somewhere between 50,000 and up to 100,000 rand a cycle of treatment. But today, um, we have better utilization. So from one cycle of treatment, we could get another, get the patient pregnant in the cycle and have another four to six embryos in the freezer, which the patient has paid for already. So subsequent treatment for another baby, they come back two years later, we warm the embryos, we put it back, which is very inexpensive, and they have another baby. So, and the patients tend to call that time walk twins. So here you have embryos conceived in the same cycle, and yet the first two that went back achieves the first pregnancy, and the other two that you put back two years later gets the patient pregnant again. Mm -hmm. um, but the conception occurred at the time that the first baby was conceived. So the utilization is far better. So ultimately, the amount of uh, attempts that you can have from one attempt is much better. Whereas in the past, we never had a robust freezing technology and we were ending up discarding viable, valuable embryos. But today, freezing embryos is significantly better. And in fact, we've also found that today in a lot of patients, frozen embryo transfers give us better pregnancies than transfers in the fresh stimulated cycle. Because in the better stimulated in what cycle, sense? the patient's got very high hormones. But in a, a frozen embryo transfer cycle, the cycle is very natural. 
and uh, it's not detrimental to the embryo. So not everybody who has a stimulated fresh transfer will get pregnant, but they do better when you put their frozen embryos back. Wow. Doctor, thank you so much. It's been quite an insightful conversation. And, uh, yeah, after the show, we'll, we'll talk some more about that, that, that frozen embryo treatment. <laughs> okay. I think I'll be needing that. So, Doctor, for those who want to get in touch with you, how do they contact you? They can either look at our website, so that's www.vitalab.com. Our egg bank, where we freeze eggs and where we actually donate eggs uh, to recipient couples who need eggs, uh, with the older age group, that is www.veda, V-E-D-A, dot C-O dot Z-A. Otherwise, you can contact our reception on 11 4700 Repeated, 11 4700 Thank you so much, Dr. Lawrence Govitz, who is an infinity specialist at Vita Lab.